Something I never would have foreseen coming is something I certainly didn't set out to. Just had a terrible loss 23 years ago now, 24 years. Time goes by. Go, 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 go up to West England in an area called the Cotswolds. Beautiful area with these covered bridges and little David Winter cottages, what an area. So I had a four-year-old son, Jeremy, an 18-month-old daughter, Amelia, and my son had sat all day, poor, poor guy, he's a bundle of energy, four years old, and I promised him when I, when I put him down that night that um, tomorrow you can get up and run in those moors and just you and your dad are gonna go out there, we're gonna have the greatest time. We got up, did our shopping, and that night, one of these stereotypical, you might say, dark and stormy nights where it was too, too dark not to have headlights, or it was too bright to have headlights, that, it was just a perfect time when it was mist on the windshield, you couldn't really see. And the last thing I remember are two headlights in, in my face. To this day, I don't know why the guy didn't swerve. Knocked our car 60 feet. Uh, Amelia was killed on impact. Jeremy was in a coma. And my wife at that time just screamed and screamed and screamed. For three decades, thousands of stories were given life in our print room before being sent to your home. Each week, an individual walks into this room to give life to an incredible one-of-a-kind story. These aren't your local politicians or well-known celebrities. They are everyday people much like yourself, eager to share a piece of their lives with you. Oh, I was just absolutely uh, overwhelming. One child is is dead and in the morgue. Another child is on life support and he had all the signs of life and pink cheeks and rosy lips and he looked fine. We had the best brain surgeons in all of England in Bristol trying to look at why the swelling in his brain wouldn't go down. And we said a little prayer over him and collected a pathetic bundle of clothing and uh, removed life support from him. There was nothing that could be done. I've really never been able to tell this part yet without tears. And my uh, brother Scott in Texas, when he found out, turned his truck around and went to Dallas and got on Air France and flew over immediately. It was the third day, maybe even the second day. When I saw him, I thought it was a ghost. And so I just passed that on the floor, which I started to do for the next two weeks while we were stuck over there. So he would stay with me for the next 10 days. You know, that would have been two weeks, about this close, because I would just collapse because of all the overwhelming information. And you both feel like roadkill. You've been slammed by an 18 wheeler truck. Help me, I've been run over. Help me, I need help. I need two, I've been run over too. Help me, help, I can't move, I can't move, I can't either. And so 83% of child loss marriages end in divorce, as clinical and as sterile as that sounds, and we were no exception. I went on a mission to feel good. Pushing her around in the wheelchair, doing my dutiful husband deal. And uh, I said, you know what? I think I know how to get through this grief. I'm gonna make myself a cocktail. I'm gonna put some rock and roll music on, a little Van Halen maybe, and I'll just ease the Chase Lounge back and let the sun burn it out of me. Well, I'm from Texas. When you fall off a horse, you get back on. So we had another child again as soon as we could. She's barely out of the wheelchair. You think I was done grieving the deaths of my two kids and I got another child in my hands? 
And we both agreed this is the only way out of this thing. Well, I didn't know that replace the loss wasn't going to work. That's all I knew. Dog dies, get another one. Goldfish dies, get another one. A child dies, you get another one. Ridiculous. That daughter is the most precious thing in the world to me now, as you might imagine, Sophia. That was no way to cope. You know, as a lot of parents do, I've discovered as a grief counselor, you just don't let each other grieve in his or her own way. And I'm sure we wanted each other to be different. Um, that sounds kind of strange. It's probably just as simple as that. You sit in a huge room, tell your story, cry, pass the Kleenex every week, every week. Around the ragged rock, the rugged story ran, and it's the same story over and over. And then I finally saw Mrs. Johnson sitting over here after about six months of doing that. Mrs. Johnson is in as much pain today as when her little Dickie drowned 25 years ago. Building an identity around your pain, an identity around, I can't, around your story, I, I can't do that. Or they gave me advice for getting through the day. Stay engaged with people, drink lots of water, and get a hobby. And get a hobby, I need some real help. So I started to go to therapists. The therapist said you need to let go and move on. So let go of what and move on to where? They didn't have an answer for me, but I kept going. I didn't have any health insurance, but I kept shelling out hundreds and thousands of dollars. Then a buddy of mine said, you know what? We got this big guy over here at this seminary. He's got a couple of PhDs and gonna take you on. And I really like this guy. He said, you have to accept your brokenness. He said it just like that, I'll never forget. And I said, well, how do I do that? Keep coming. So I did. After trying everything and nothing was working, I just came to the point where I have to recover or die. It got to the point where I didn't even want to re I didn't even want to be reminded of my children anymore. And I know that sounds bad, I'm not proud of that. Because every time I would think back fondly about something, the memories would tear me up. And the fond memories would rip my heart out over and over. And eventually, if I'm gonna function, I just would rather not be reminded of them. If I can just get my mind around this pain and this disaster and this nightmare and just get my head around it and just figure it out and, and, and get my questions answered, then I'll feel better. And I didn't know I was trying to fix my heart with my head. I didn't know I was doing it. I was trying to think myself into feeling better. My instructor uh, said, uh, well, it feels like I'm trying to take something away from you, doesn't it? Like, yeah. He says, I am. I'm taking away, I want to take away your pain. Ha <laughs> ha, that's all I got. He said, well, pain doesn't equal love, pain equals pain. I was stupefied and dumbfounded to realize I started to be happy to be reminded of them. That's when I knew something had happened. Something's changed. I'm happy to be reminded of my kids because a fond memory staying fond. Jeremy, I love you. I miss you. Goodbye. Goodbye to the physical relationship I once had, so I could say hello to the new emotional, spiritual perspective in that pain, no, in that in that relationship, no longer based on pain, but based on love. I'm interested in the person who realizes that just talking about it is not enough, just crying about it is not enough, and nothing works. That's kind of my deal. That's where I like, now we can get started.